This is Lizzie from Let Zoe Spoil You and Sagira from Sagira Salutes You. And together we are Newbie versus Weeaboo. Sagira, Newbie. Lizzie, a Weeaboo. It's, it's Newbie versus Weeaboo. Weeaboo. Oh no. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that's going to get edited out. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's not how we greet the entire world. <clears throat> oh, hi. Hi, hi. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I belched when Lizzie started recording, so now I've got the giggles. Sorry. <laughs> the tone is suitably um, ruined for this episode. Especially... Oh, completely. I mean, yeah, it's it's not really. We shouldn't really be laughing because it's devastating, devastating uh, episodes that we have just seen of our current anime of Parasite, and we're up to episode nine, and it's called Beyond Good and Evil. Now, I feel like I've heard this somewhere before. We open in a busy city, and it settles on Kana, who senses not Sunichi but Hideo. He is clearly stalking her, so he is after her now. He knows that she knows something. And I'm pretty sure that's pretty much all we see of her for the rest of the time, which is a bit <laughs> worrying. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Where'd it gotta go? Hmm. But she runs and she bumped into M- Mitsuo, who now wants to fight Hideo because the girl he likes is freaked out by him. So it's like, well, you're something to punch. I'll punch <laughs> you because he's an angry young man. Yeah. So they go off to a quiet men's room where Hideo lays him out. His <laughs> bonds fell and he's down. And he says, next time I will end you. Which, you know, good for keeping low and everything. Because, you know, incognito and everything. As Hideo leaves, he notices he's being watched. And it's Uko. She hides and blushes and she's clearly smitten with the boy. Oh, poor but he vanishes. He just disappears. Oh, a duet. (laughs) We see Sunichi looking at some test results on a board, and we know that this is a flashback because he's wearing his glasses. Mm -hmm. As we now know, he does not need them, so this is a flashback. And also, they're wearing middle school uniforms. No, I didn't notice that much. What do you mean you don't know the different Japanese uniforms depending on your year group? How could I you? Know, I know. I'm a bad newbie. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a bad weeaboo. I'm not sure about bad newbie. <laughs> but now I know, don't I? But yes, he's looking at a test scoreboard and his name is called Ayu Sunichi, which we've heard quite a few times throughout this whole thing. And it's Murano. And this is their first meeting, and Sunichi is shy, and he's bumbling. It's the good old Sunichi that we used to know. But going back to now, they meet there again, and the relationship has clearly changed. <laughs> it went from, oh, Sunichi, we could be in the same class. Ah, we great mirror to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can hear the cicadas chirping <laughs> like you know it's like oh dear they're on the rocks at the moment yeah it's like she doesn't know him anymore so it's a stranger now yeah. but you know she's not exactly wrong he has changed quite a bit oh yeah she's oh she's very perceptive as we know <laughs> Hideo is stalking Sunichi from afar trying to work out the weak signal because he's like oh but it, it seems like it's asleep but I can still sense it so what is happening with this boy I don't know why he's got that voice but... I don't know why exactly <laughs> sound a little bit like <laughs> wait a minute uh, I need to I need to distinguish each one so, okay. so he's <laughs> sounding voice. slightly like European there yes a little bit <laughs> ah we <laughs> <laughs> now he thinks that if he shows murderous intent high murderous intent then Miggy should at least react in some way he should be like oh, Shinichi there's murderous intent nearby but Shinichi shows nothing and he walks away without even noticing, and it's like, oh, no. <laughs> They're so. getting smarter. In school, Akiko, Akiko, Flickiko questions Yuko about her attraction to Hideo and how she's drawing him. She's like, oh, I see that you're drawing him, therefore you must love him. <laughs> my nosy bitch. Yes. <laughs> she, she is. <laughs> she's just like... She's not my favourite, got to admit. I'm just like, can you stop being such a, like, a whiny, like, hey! Like, shush! Just let your she's friends kind of, mature. She's kind of the Captain Obvious of this. It's kind yeah. of like clarifying for the audience, 
this is what's happening with this girl character. I am letting you know she clearly likes him because she's drawing a picture. If you didn't get that in the last freaking episode, yeah. <laughs> I am the girl gossip of this show. But she's like, oh, can you draw a picture of him for me? It's like, just take a picture on your phone like every other freaking person. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make this poor. Are you got to pay a commission? Like, you know, <laughs> you can't just ask an artist for a picture and expect it to be free. That's true to life. <laughs> She also says that she, it, she's like, he's so perfect, it's almost like he's fake. Dun, dun, dun. And this gets you coping. She's like, a fake? Now, normally, you'd just be like, yeah, ha ha. Yeah, he seems like he's not from this world. But like in this climate, current climate that they're living yeah. in, it's like, all oh, suspicion is everywhere. And it's also, once you learn more about like, you know, the family background and the brother's job, you kind of realise that she's in an environment where you would question things like that a little bit more than the average teenage girl would. In Sunichi's home, the police are talking to Dad about what he saw. They are telling him he can't go public yet, so it's now being acknowledged that the police or the authorities are onto this. They know that something's not right with Japan right now. Yep. <laughs> There's something amiss, something not of this world. They say that they need to investigate further before they can make it go public. But they seem to know so much that they actually have a drawing of what people have seen. It's like, so there must be more survivors from these attacks, which then makes me question, why hasn't it gone more public? If there's, if There seems to be quite a lot of people surviving to tell the tale. Why aren't they telling their friends who are telling their friends who are telling their because families? Because if their you dog? tell people that you've seen a monster or you've seen something weird, you will not fit the Japanese mould of everybody being like the same working component. People will start thinking you're weird and you don't want to be thought of as weird in Japan. You want to be thought of as one of the working cogs in society. But what's the difference of telling the police then? So if they come to the police, well, because if you can't solve a problem, the, you know, you go to your police. They are the ones that, it's out of their hands then. It's like, I've seen something weird. It's now your responsibility to kind of like deal with it and the police are very much we'll cover that up because we don't want to aim to the outside world that anything bad is happening in japan because we're quite perfect also I, it could possibly be that they had just one person come in and say i saw this weird thing and they've kind yeah. of gone yeah whatever but then they've gone oh wait we did have that case with that guy who saw the same thing yeah. maybe it wasn't a dream maybe it wasn't a concussion hallucination Maybe they are related because it's very convenient that they saw the same thing. So maybe yeah. it's that as well. They realise that they can morph into anything, but they don't seem to know much at this stage. That's all they seem to know. It's like they yeah. can morph. Whoopee. And do they say that they eat people? I'm not sure if we've got to that point yet. I'm not sure at this point. But they know they can morph. We know that for sure. Yeah. So Nietzsche comes in and he's like, oh, hey. And they're like, bye. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's some guys here. Cool. I'll go to my room. A dark room and Rico is talking to a man. Now, this is a very important scene. She's concerned that people are onto them and due to their imperfections, they are weak and will be easily wiped out. The man doesn't seem too bothered and says basically she's overthinking. Oh, typical woman overthinking things. She wants to know what parasites are. And the man says, man has become toxic to this earth and there was a need for an an antidote yeah so now we know that it is made parasites have been made by man or maybe another parasite who knows at this point because yeah. he was he was very mysterious and when he said that i was like oh oh and he's gonna find out like because obviously i know where they come from but it's just like oh oh the underlying theme of the show is going to start becoming more apparent well, the thing is, like, he was all, like, in darkness and we couldn't truly see him. And yeah. it's like, well, I, he's not all he seems to be either. So we've kind of got the... I feel like it's one of those things of we're going back to a mystery within a mystery within a question oh, within a yes, mystery. Yes. <laughs> we're back to that again. So it's like, oh, I found something out. Probably not the whole yeah. truth. See, and I don't, want to, I don't want to kind of add anything to this scene because I know that I would add something that would make... Like, it's like no, it's not yet. It's not yet. It's not time for me to add things. <laughs> and want to so badly go Ooh! but i oh, know well it's only episode nine was are we are we even halfway yet no, not, yet. <laughs> not even halfway so yeah we've still got a lot a lot of ground to cover well this makes rico question the thing inside her and is it poison because if he's saying that humans are indeed a parasite themselves yeah 
then this thing inside her what is it doing to her you know she's she's she can only go off of what she's been told or what she researches. So if she's been told this thing inside her is uh, not good, yeah. then <laughs> what are you to think? Back at home, Dad and Sunichi talk about the visit from earlier. Dad tells him what happened on that day. He's like, son, it's finally time I tell you exactly what I saw. And Sunichi pretends to not know anything. He doesn't add anything to the conversation. He's not like, oh, yeah, look, here's Miggy. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> It feels it's like now is not the time to bring that up or ever because he's obviously like a parasite well, himself. Well, that's it, isn't it? It's like, oh, hey, you know that thing that killed mum? Here's one on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, not the time as dad is in a very fragile. But dad looks better. He looks yeah. like he's overcoming what's happened and he's trying think, to deal with yeah. it rather than now there's it. acknowledgement that what he saw was real and he's like a key witness in all of this and being taken seriously and not like just a loony bit on holiday it's like <laughs> okay that's probably rest assured and the fact that he now knows that someone is out there actively trying to like find the person who killed his wife he's getting some closure on those like unfulfilled emotions of like my wife is dead i can't talk about what really happened no one believes me and the killer got away and also as Sunichi says, it's the first time that his father has said out loud that his mum is dead. Yeah. So it, that acknowledgement is coming to terms with it and now they can do something about it. At Yuko's house, her brother has fallen asleep on the sofa. Now we know that her brother is a detective because she they had a conversation about it in an early episode. Yeah. Yuko comes in and sees the sketch of the parasite on the table and she's like, eh. That's gross. <laughs> and the brother wakes up snatching it off of her. He's like, no, don't look at that. It's like, now she could have just thought it was just a picture. Yeah. <laughs> just a weird thing that you're just, you know, hey, I'm going to make a comic book and this is the main character. Like, he could have said anything. But by snatching it off of her, going, don't look at it. It's like, it's like hmm, uh, very suspicious. Just, it's like, could that be your police sketchbook? Are you <laughs> like, oh, rather than your, like, you know, fun time sketchbook? Exactly, yeah, way to go for keeping it calm and, you know, <laughs> keeping your emotions in check. Well done. I think that's why he's a police sketch artist rather than an actual police officer. <laughs> yeah. He's an artist, they're emotional. Yuko shows her brother the picture that she drew of Hideo and asks him if he gets any personality from what he sees as he is a sketch artist himself. She's like, but this is what you do. And he's like, not quite. <laughs> I don't quite am able to tell a whole person's personality just by looking at them. At school, Hideo is still spying. Yuko spots him and spies herself. So it's spy inception. Yep. <laughs> spy on a spy. Now, a ball is thrown and conks him on the head. And without flinching, he kind of turns around and he's got a dent in his <laughs> yeah. head. Because he's got a squishy parasite head. So he's just like, oh, that's... He wasn't really thinking about keeping his nice solid form because... He assumes no human is smart enough to actually be onto him or even like he's like he thinks he's being well sneaky, but he forgets that female <laughs> intuition is um a big deal in this series. So Yuko sees this but hides before she's seen and he kind of covers it up when the guy comes over and goes, Hey, give us a ball back and he's like, Here you go, and he pops it back in <laughs> yeah. pops his head back in. And Yuko is freaking out. And she's just like, Fake face, fake face. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's on to him. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of good that she had this crush, really, because she yeah. wouldn't have started spying on him and then she wouldn't have found out what she now knows. Sometimes it's good to be a creepy stalker. <laughs> it's never good. It's never good <laughs> to be a creepy it's stalker. Like, disclaimer, don't listen to <laughs> yeah, that. Disclaimer, advice. it's never good. <laughs> don't be a creepy stalker. <laughs> In school, Sunichi wants to fix his relationship with Murano because it's ever getting worse. <laughs> He's trying to explain the Kano incident, saying, oh, she was just making fun of me, blah. But Miggy wakes, sensing Hideo's murderous intent. Da, da, da. Cut to Hideo and Miss Mitsuo outside. He and his gang uh, are surrounding him and they want to fight. Mitsuo is like, I've got my gang with me. We're going to oh. fight you because you're a douche. And it is the 90s and it was the mm -hmm. era of just angry Japanese youth that just used to get into fights all the time. But then Hideo suggests that they go somewhere quiet. Now, already this is suspicious on Hideo's part because it's like, you're going to get beaten up by a gang and you want to be somewhere private? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you have something up your sleeve. Miggy tells Sunichi there will be a massacre if they don't get involved. He asks Sunichi what he wants to do. Now, this is the start. Well, we've been seeing it going on, but in this episode, it's the start of Miggy 
changing in a way of like he's asking Sunichi's opinion now instead yeah. of just going right we've got to go we've got to go and fix this we've got to kill because otherwise we'll get found out etc he says to Sunichi what should we do and it's like wow Miggy is actually becoming a team with yeah. his host it's quite interesting is... it's like it's layers of like he's asking permission but also consent he understands that he does not have the total right to that body and it's a shared thing and that they're going to have to make decisions together. But also he understands that he needs to keep Shinichi informed of these things to make sure, because he could easily not tell Shinichi this stuff was going on, but he feels that he should. So mm. it's, it's kind of a layer of not empathy, but working towards that. How would this make Shinichi feel if I keep it from him? And also now they are their heart is joined. He is joined to Sinichi's heart, so he knows what Sinichi is feeling much stronger than he did before. So, and I, I'm sure it would probably affect Miggy in some way. Sinichi says, I have no choice. <laughs> I have to go and help because there's murderous intent involved. So he parkours his way out, <laughs> leaving his bag behind. At the fighting spots, the place where all the brawling happens, it's like the spot. I'm surprised there's no cameras there, as it's a well-known <laughs> fighting spot. But Hideo offers to fight them all at once and says something is coming to stop them, Sunichi. So if it's going to happen, it has to happen now because he just wants to slice and dice, get rid of them. End of problem. Sunichi runs and bounds over the wall in time. And Hideo is shocked by what Sunichi can do. He's like, <gasps> that is not normal human, like, you know, athletics there. Yeah, weird hideo face. He's just got the weirdest face. Yeah, it's like you'd be <laughs> so handsome if you didn't look like there's something inhuman going on, which is <laughs> exactly. kind of the point, really. Hideo explains he's the victim in this situation, which he kind of is. I mean, he keeps getting pulled away to get beaten yeah, up. And it's, not his, it's not his fault he could cut them all he down. Basically if he really wasn't reason. asking for a fight, but yeah. he's certainly not going to like just let it happen without him getting like, yeah. Well, these boys just keep interrupting him. And it's like, this is one thing I don't need when I'm on a spy mission. Yeah. So if I just get rid of you, then that's one less thing to worry about. And also, they keep following him around. So like Yuko, they might see something that they're not supposed yeah. to see. So why not eliminate that? Sunichi tells him to go. So he does. Mitsuo turns his attention to Sunichi, who warns Yano not to mess with Hideo again. And he says that this guy is the leader. Now, this baffles Mitsuo because he's like, how would he have known that he's the leader? Because at this point, we thought that Mitsuo was the leader yeah. because he's the one calling all the shots. He's the one who keeps gathering the gang. Well, he's not. He's not the leader. He's the strongest. Well, this is but this is what I'm saying. We didn't know he's not the leader because it's not been said. You just well, assume from the way that he's acting because we don't know Yana. We've oh no. Yano. We've not seen this guy before. So we just assume that Mits, as an audience that Mitsuo is, is the leader of that gang. But yeah, he's the one I mean, who does he still all the could be. He still could be. Yano's just the strongest heavy in the gang. He's the physical well, strongest. Sunichi says, because you're the leader of this gang. No, he says, because you're the strongest. Watch the dub. Because <laughs> he says, you're the leader. You're their leader, aren't you? No, so. he says, uh, you're watch the, the strongest. Dub. Watch the dub. <laughs> he's the strongest. Because being the strongest doesn't automatically make you the leader. Because if you're the strongest watch but have no brains. Dub. Watch oh, the dub. stupid dub. <laughs> Yano steps forward and tries to punch Sunichi, but he catches the punch with his left hand. Not the Miggy hand, oh. but with his left hand. And then he gives them all a warning. Now, yeah, this is showing that his the strength has gone from his right hand to the rest of his body now. So not only superhuman speed, superhuman boundiness, but also yep. now superhuman uh, strength. Yep. So he is becoming... A mixture of the Hulk and the Flash. <laughs> He's the flunk. <laughs> or the hash. Yana walks away disturbed, knowing that Sinichi could kill him. He could feel his murderous intent. <laughs> Murano has Sinichi's bag, so he goes back over to her and gets it. Hideo arrives and Sinichi grabs Murano to protect her. It's just like... Whoop. Hideo questions what happened to the gang and if he sub used his hand, Dub used his new friend. No, that's stupid! <laughs> no, bad Dub, bad Dub. Go sit <laughs> in the corner and think about it. Because it's, it's, he's more subtle than that. He's implying, did he use his inhuman strength to murder them all? Not, did he get Miggy to do it? Well, that's what he says. <laughs> 
Either way, it angers Zanichi. Whatever he said, it angered him. <laughs> and he tells him to go. So he does. <laughs> it's quite easy to <laughs> get rid of, really. He's very compliant, isn't he? It's like, go away. Okay. <laughs> I've got better things to do than chat to you. Murano questions his relationship with Hideo. And Zanichi uses colourful language to describe it, calling him a bastard and other words that yeah. I don't use on this podcast. She says he's acting strange. And they, these are words that don't normally come out of his mouth and they don't suit him. She doesn't like who he's becoming and asks again if he's Sunichi. Now he shouts at her to shut up. <laughs> it's like, whoa, oh. you told the girl you like to shut up. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, try getting out of that one. So she leaves. <laughs> yeah, good on her. It's like, no, you don't need to talk to me that way. I'm just worried about you. Screw you, I'm going. At home, Sunichi thinks it's the hole in his chest that's changed him. Miggy says he has in a way, as he recovers quicker from his mood swings, and his thoughts are more logical. And of course, Miggy thinks these are pluses because he's like, hey, we can, you know, fight better and stuff if you're like that. And then he says something about, I can cheer you up further or something. And <laughs> Sunichi's like, thanks, Miggy. And it's like, he's naked in a bathroom. Um... <laughs> yeah. It's like, do you just want to get a bit of extra penis on your penis? Like, <laughs> what are you implying here? Hmm. <laughs> I'm sure it's all very innocent, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the hand job in that situation could be quite, like, insane. It'd be very strange. Yeah. No, don't want to see that scene. No. <laughs> That's the after hours <laughs> parasite yeah. show. In town, Yuko thinks back to Hideo's dented head, <laughs> as you would. As you would, because it's a weird thing to happen at school. <laughs> and once again, she is following him. He goes in the alley and she watches as he transforms into someone else. Now, if there's not a screaming thing saying, this person isn't right. Yeah, stranger this danger! Is it. Stranger if, danger! If she's had any doubts, this has now shown her, you know what, I'm right. He's not all that he cracks up to be. Yep, she is on to him. And the fact that she's got a detective brother, you know, she's got the sleuthiness about her. Yep. Back at hers, Yuko is freaking out. <laughs> she's putting together all she has seen so far. And then she questions her brother about the case that he's working on. So she starts asking about the picture without actually saying, oh, hey, there's this dude I know. She's like, no, I'm just going to ask him about what he's doing to see if it's related. They talk about what they know. And Yuko... Is freaking scared. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this poor girl. So, She's just like, every day, just like this gibbering wreck of, oh my God, there's this thing living in my city. Uh, yeah. And goes to school with me and I used to have a crush on it and I think it eats people. Well, she hasn't told her brother that she knows a parasite because he keeps saying, it's very unlikely that you'll bump into one. I'm sure you'll never see one. She's like, ah, ha, ha, yeah. yeah so uh, uh. keep that on the down low. But she wants to ask Hideo herself. And it's like, you've just heard these things eat people. Why would you put yourself in a situation where like, hey, by the way, do you eat people? No one's going to react well to that. At school, Yuko goes to the art room and she's trying to find something that will help her in case all things go wrong. Hideo meets with her in a quiet room and she tells him all that she knows. Basically, she's saying, look, I've heard this about you and I think that you're this. Is it true? He seems shocked, but not shocked at the same. I don't know. He's kind of like not knowing how to he's, respond. He's very. I mean, he's definitely shocked that she knows, but I think he's more shocked that a human he underestimated is confronting her. him. Yeah, and yeah. is confronting him. It's like how this this creature has the audacity to be like, "I know what you did," and he's like, uh, "No, I am superior being. You are stupid girl." Well, she asks him to leave town, and he asks if anyone else knows. In class, Mizzy, Miggy senses what is happening. Extremely creepy <laughs> parasite <laughs> transformation. What? His freaking bug eyes. Like, and like the fact that like, his face is cracking before it actually yeah. opens. And it's just, whoa, it's the worst transformation I think we've seen so far. It's not a nice one. And then in class, Sunichi shouts, sub, stupid asshole, in dub. That son of a bitch. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really see why asshole is like because obviously they dub these things because they think it'll sound better and more colloquial do america oh, no, that was the sub that was the subtitle is son of a bitch no um stupid asshole 
Jimmy Lasso, yeah. So I don't know if it's yeah. a quite cool thing. But yeah, but America would have redubbed it because they thought arsehole was either too strong a word or not colloquially enough to be used in America. I think, because I think it's still, still series is rated like a 15, but arsehole is implying a hole in your ass, which is more dirty than you just being a son of a whore, really. You know, and it's like, oh no, the sexualization of that word. Oh no, we have to change it. I might just call him an arsehole. An arsehole's an arsehole. But then it's the credits. And yeah. that's where it's left. And thank God we get to watch a second episode. Yes, because it's like, I was oh, like, oh, Yuko! What? I know. I was like, oh, not Yuko. Please, not Yuko. She's just been so sweet this whole time. Don't kill the sweet ones. Oh, no. We move on to episode 10, which is called What Mad Universe? <laughs> yeah, because things go tits up here. We open with Sunichi ready to kill Hideo. He realises Yuko's not there and walks out. We open with Sunichi ready to kill Hideo. He realises Yuko is not in the class with him, so he walks out. Da, 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 da. Art room. Hideo swipes at Yuko, knocking the paint thin on the floor. She takes her chance, throwing it into his gaping head. It works! It burns! Yep. And she tries to escape out of the window, which... She's yep. such a brave girl. I was like, I why did you not do this meeting on a bottom floor? It's probably because all the bottom floors would have been maybe active classrooms at the time. But I'm like... Or where you can get out of the room. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a door next to her. Or was I wrong about that? Um, yeah, it'd be, but it would be just a door into the next classroom over. So she or a cupboard. Just, or, a, <laughs> or the art cupboard, yeah. It's like, her choices are the window or the window, really. But still, I was like, although, bloody brave girl. She did have a plan, but it was just bloody brave. And it works. But yeah, she goes out the window, which is noticed by the rugby team outside. They're like, hey, check that out. Thank goodness they were out there, though. Yeah. A tentacle joins her outside. Like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> So she has no choice but to jump. And she falls through a tree, which in most cartoons and stuff, the tree is there to slow down your fall. <laughs> yep. And she hits the floor, but she's okay. She's not dead. She's still alive. And the rugby I mean, team all run over. Okay. is the thing. I mean, she's pretty unconscious and probably broken a few things, but she's alive. That's what I mean by okay. She's not <laughs> dead. <laughs> yeah. The rugby boys run over and uh, check her out. And then they're like, hey, did you see that tentacle thing? Yeah, let's go check it out. <laughs> what the it's hell? Like, it's, there was something slithering in the classroom. And it's just like, do you think it's more like giant snakes around the place? But like, if, if I thought a giant snake was in a classroom, I wouldn't be like, hey, hey, hey. But then if I'm not a teenage boy. But then if there was something in a classroom that made a girl jump out the window... It's like, well, best stay away from that then. <laughs> if it's made her jump out the freaking window for Maybe like two go stories tell back. a teacher, you know, an adult in the situation. Sunichi wanders the halls and Miggy informs him that he's not sure it is Hideo because he can sense that, he, he senses that his thoughts are incoherent. He can't get a proper communication or a proper wavelength from Hideo because it's just so jumbled. And that's due to the paint thinner being inside him. Yes. <laughs> It's obviously like frying some brain cells and some neural networks, so he's not really got conducive normal thought pattern anymore. The rugby boys are met by a teacher, and they talk about the something that's making a noise, and the teacher's like, you stay here, I'll go look. And the boys are like, no, we'll come with you. Stupid boys, yeah. you're dead. Hideo stumbles around, unable to leave attack mode, so his head is just out. <laughs> And, he's, you know, he's looking quite suspicious at this point. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, weird mushroom blobbity head design with bladed tentacles. And, and three eyes. Yeah, and he's just running on pure instinct now rather than any kind of logical thought. Well, this is it. He's saying that the dead cells are present presenting. The dead cells are preventing inner communication. And then we see a fly drift by and he instinctively kills it. But he doesn't understand why he's doing that. And this is what I put down to his reptilian brain waking up. That kind of thing of just reacting and yeah. doing to survive rather yeah. than like you say like calm thought and actually trying to figure out how to get out of the situation yes. yeah. teacher and boys arrive teacher thinks he's got something he's like take that thing off your head it's like oh teacher oh dear yeah. <laughs> you just see it and go but <laughs> well i think you kind of have that thing where logic overrides and you try and like justify it so i mean the masks are pretty good now so he probably just thought someone's got some stupid prop on their head from the school play or something 
Well, it cost him, and they dead. All yeah. three dead. Miggy senses this. He's like, oh, there goes three. <laughs> <laughs> Tally up. Students and teachers see the carnage. So more people are becoming involved. They're like, ah, there's hideousness going on. Miggy tells Sinichi Hideo is heading to his classroom. <laughs> he's like, he's like, my classroom. And it's like, is that kind of attitude of, I just came from there. Yeah. <laughs> I just made it all the way up here and now I've got to turn around. Back he goes, parkouring his way, as he does. He's then met with a wall of students, so he can't go any further. And Miggy doesn't think it's a good time to fight and they should evacuate. Again, Miggy yeah. growth. Because last time he was like, ah, oh, a wall of flesh, perfect. Yes. <laughs> this will help us. But this time he's like, oh, let's not fight. Let's go outside and see what's going on. That's Miggy using his noodle. The teachers are panicking. Well done, teachers, keeping it calm for the kids. <laughs> Although the kids are thinking it's some sort of prank or something. They're like, well, no, this is some context for why the kids seem it's so calm about this. Okay, so in the 90s, I talk about the Lost Decade a lot and the dissatisfied like, youth culture movement. But there's always a period of like a real rise in youth violence, um, violence in school and knife crime. So you know how everyone's like, ah, oh, America and gun crime and shootings in school. But Japan had a similar thing of like knifings in school and like obviously the school suicides and a lot of teenage murderers. Because during this period of history, if you committed a violent act or a murder before you hit 17 you're not sent to prison you're tried as a child and sent to kind of a juvenile detention where you were rehabilitated and, and taught why that was a bit naughty and obviously it's not really that bad it's like an 18 week course of like you shouldn't do things child go back and be a functioning adult society so well all the kids were kind of slightly going mad because of the adult suicide and their loss of respect and hating the system and the pressure and stuff there was this weird phenomenon where teenagers were like um, I watch it's on YouTube somewhere it's really interesting documentary that interviewed some of these kids and they were like well I worked out that oh, I'm unhappy with life there's no point in anything but if I murder someone I get away with it so we might as well murder people before we hit 17 so there was a rash of very very extreme like killings there was like there was a school decapitation one that happened around about 1997 um there was the golden week killer who just decided to on the bus just get up and stab everybody on the bus because he just went on the course and got away with it because he was under the age of 17 so knife crime was up and these violent acts were happening in school quite a bit so students were kind of like really prepped for this like if your classmates start stabbing people, just just leave. So they are, so part of them is like this weird desensitization to what was going on because it was kind of a bit of a regular occurrence. And part of it is like obviously like thinking, well, it's not real. The teachers are just being over serious about something or other. But what these scenes are kind of like representing was that climate of school violence that was happening at the time. Have the laws changed since then? Yes. They <laughs> reduced their age of if so you can be tried as an adult for murder at 14 now that's, but it's sad it had to go all the way down to 14 because yeah. that was the age of the murderers jeez that's that's scary yeah oh it was horrific <laughs> when the decapitation and it was just some kids in school like, at the age of 14 thought we we're bored let's decapitate one of our friends at school that's crazy Ooh. Anyway, <laughs> okay, good context. Um, but yeah, so the kids are kind of like just wandering out, and the teachers are freaking out. So the teacher says that class three or something isn't out, and that's Murano's class. So of course, Sunichi has to go back in. Sunichi runs back and sees Murano's class are running outside, and they're all panicking, and she's not there. She's somewhere still in the building. So he runs upstairs and is met with a bloodbath of students. Yep. And this is the biggest reaction we've had out of Sinji for a long time. He's just distraught with this. Yeah. It is horrific. It's awful. It's just like it's like the scene in The Shining with the corridor filling with blood. It's Apart from it's this horrible. not being a dream sequence, it's this being the mangled body of like fellow schoolmates all down the corridor. And you can understand why the people who have seen this are freaking the fudge out. Of and, course, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's just this monster thing slicing and dicing. It's like, what can you do? Like, you can't escape it. It's too quick. So, yeah, a lot of students died. Miggy tries to calm him down, of course. Sinichi is in pain, saying that it feels like his heart is ripping in two. 
And this goes again back to the whole thing of he feels more now, he's more sensitive to stuff. So whereas like you feel heartbroken, he literally feels like his heart is going to rip apart. He says he can't do this anymore. And Murano and his dad flash in his mind saying that he's changed. Now this focuses him back to being straight-minded and thinking about what to do next. He thinks he sees Murano on the floor. So he rolls a girl over and it's not her. He just says, sorry, I thought you were someone else. It's like, oh, that's horrible. Like her face, oh my goodness. Oh yeah, with the tears and everything. She died in absolute fear and terror and agony. Awful. Really good art animation though to make you feel that strongly about something. Hideo is detected, still on that floor. Sunichi stops to listen and he can sense who is on that floor. This really impresses Niggy. He's like, hey, well done. Because he's like, there's three and Hideo. (laughs) Cool, well done. (laughs) He finds Murano alive. Yay. And there's two other students with her. He wants to help them get out. But the two boys don't want to go. They're like, we don't want to go back down that corridor. It's down there somewhere. Plus they they have to walk through the corpses. Yes, they have to relive what they've just seen. But then they're like, wait a minute, you came from that direction. That means that you must not be human. You must be one of them. So they both freak out, run, slash, slash. It's like, oh, dudes, (laughs) you could have survived. Oh, So Hideo is just around the corner. Now, if that's not one of the scariest things. (laughs) Mentally compromised, instinctive killing machine. And also it's in pain as well. So it's, yeah, it's going to survival mode of I need to, I'm out in the open. No one can see me like this. I'm an immense amount of pain and I need to fix myself. It's like, okay, he's in full murderous intent. (laughs) Yes. Well, Sunichi picks up Murano and just runs into the nearest classroom. And he realises that parasites and humans cannot coexist Mm. as they have to follow their directive. It's like he's killed, he's eaten people, there is no way that this is going to be a friendly union. (laughs) Sunichi jumps out the window with Murano and then over a fence and they sit for a moment and Murano is clearly (laughs) traumatised. Who wouldn't (laughs) be? I mean, now that just happens so quickly. You can't even like, you know, think about what happened. And also when everything hits you, finally, oh no, it's horrible. We hear sirens and the police and ambulance have arrived. Salici leaves Murano with the paramedics and he goes back to the school. He's like, I've got to do this. As Salici knows what Hideo was and did nothing, he feels responsible for the carnage because he was like, we should have sorted this as soon as we knew, but we didn't. We gave him a chance and look what's happened. Miggy questions what they will do and Salici says, end it. Again, that's Miggy questioning yeah. whether to get rid of him or not, because this guy is um, threatening Miggy being found out. You know, if they start testing humans and things for if they have parasites, then Miggy's going to get found out. So the fact that Miggy is actually asking still, Miggy wants the police to handle it, but we see them being taken out one by one. Yeah. It's like, dude, once you see the first one go down, run. <laughs> <laughs> it's, your bang bang tools are not working yeah, it's like, I mean, kudos on you police for just trying to stick it out and trying to be like oh my comrade has died I'm going to try and keep going but like they should have ran they should have run at this point especially when it's something that you don't know what it is you don't know what it's weaknesses are Yeah. and clearly like how many bullets were shot and it was still going yeah, it's and like... you don't have any like bulletproof vests or shields or no. anything even a little bit of protection you're just a yeah just the average police officer well, Miggy says that gunfire is crap, basically. And so they need to remove the head or destroy the heart. And this gave me, again, sort of the dead flashbacks of removing the head or destroying the brain. Hideo moves towards the roof, which the police know. And Sunichi picks up a rock. Miggy warns him that he has to keep his 300 metres distance so that Hideo can't detect them. So he climbs to a roof on the opposite building from where Hideo is going. With their powers combined, Yay. they hurl a rock straight through Hideo's chest. Now, holy crap, that's some power he's got now. Yeah. I mean, like, I love that bit. Together. That's power up, and then he gets his arm there. I was like, oh, I couldn't remember which episode he got. He gets his arm. And I'm like, yay! Arm thing. He's like his muscular arm. and But they're so far away, and it goes through his chest, and it's like, whoa! 
that like, that is some mega superhuman Hulk action he's got going on there. Before he dies, Hideo curses Sunichi's name. And then the police surround the corpse. At home, Sunichi watches the news and they say that the killings were done by a drug addict with a false name. Of course, yeah, they've got to cover it up. But you know, you realise that everyone who saw Hideo died apart from those last few police officers. So there's actually no witnesses to this thing amongst the students and teachers because they're all dead. Apart from Yuko. Yes, but she's... Mm. Oh, no, yeah. She, uh, currently, mm. like, in a coma, but pretty much unconscious. But, yeah. But Yuko was the only one who lives to tell the tale. So did you think that the truth should be told... And that they should show the parasite's body. Miggy doesn't en- understand what this would achieve. I love it, just flicking through a book. <laughs> yeah. Sinichi says, like, public outcry, demand for their capture. Like, if we all band together, then hopefully they'll get rid of the parasites. But he's talking to Miggy, who is a parasite. So yeah. it's like he's forgotten what Miggy is, even though Miggy helped him to get rid of Hideo. It's like he keeps forgetting that Miggy does these things for himself. Yeah. Not for everyone else. Miggy asks, how? Like, how would this help? And Sinichi says, they could help. They could help because they can, they can sense who a parasite is. Whereas humans have no idea. Between Miggy and himself, they can find the parasites and then yeah. they can get captured, etc. Now, Miggy refuses, obviously, saying he's an ally to himself, not the humans. Uh, he, has, he keeps slapping Sinichi back into... This is what I am. You seem to forget. I am I am a parasite. I am one of these things. Yeah. But it also kind of reflects the fact that, like, she she's still a little bit naive about the situation and still kind of anime hero protagonist mode in which she's like, oh, with our powers combined, we can fight for justice and we can go join the police and help them out. But obviously Parasite being a more realistic show, it's like, the minute you turn up and offer help, they're going to just stick you in a science experiment and be like, how can we take this? And the military will come in and go, how can we weaponize this? And then you'll have like, the, oh yeah, it's just like, it's not worth the bigger picture of because humans would totally just experiment on him, weaponize him. And then you'll get the pro- plot of some kind of dystopian future where people are like, human rights, hybrid rights, ah, everything shit. It's like, no, no, no. Don't, don't reveal yourself, Shinichi. This is not the time or the place. Well, again, Shinichi is like, hey, we could help look for them. And Miggy's like, and what, kill them? Is that what you want us to do? Go around killing everything? He closes the book he's reading, which is Crime and Punishment, <laughs> which is kind of a relevant book at this point for him. Miggy says he has no emotion towards his own kind, but he asks Shinichi to imagine if their roles were reversed. Miggy then senses that this conversation is distressing Sunichi, which it is. <laughs> like, to wrap your head around everything that you just had spoken about, it's like, okay, so we've just killed a parasite. We'd be an amazing team to, to get rid of them all. However, you are a parasite. However, you don't want to kill anything unless it's for your own benefit. So people are going to die because we know the truth, but you're not going to help them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot for Sunichi to think about. Government meeting. They're discussing how people are catching on to the parasites. <laughs> They're starting to sense things. The public aren't as stupid as we think. And also that there are rumours that the Americans, of all people, are using them as military weapons. Yep. Of course they are. Of course it's the Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Japan does not like the Americans. They are always yeah. the bad guys. But yeah, they, as I said, they would weaponise it. I mean, the minute they found something like that, they'd be like, ha-ha, weaponise it. I mean, they tried to weaponize velociraptors. You know, why wouldn't they weaponize? <laughs> <laughs> they think it's time to involve the public. They want to make people aware of how to notice a parasite, but they don't want to cause panic. <laughs> so how do we overcome this? A doctor explains what a parasite can do and says they have a sentient muscle. So muscle yes. independent of thought. More medical jargon, blaga blaga, he goes on, basically telling us things that we already know. He talks of how if a part of a parasite is pulled from the body, that that part will die. So they should go round pulling people's hair to see how they react. Because the hair is a part of the parasite, it's not actually hair, it's just morphed blurger. Yep. And if they pull it off, then it's like pulling off someone's finger. It would wiggle. Yeah, would basically like and... an octopus like when you separate yes. all the bits off they still because of the neural network being across all of it so yeah they have to start pulling people's hair captain negative gets involved and says they could wear a wig 
Well, then you just like try and pull their hair off, pull the whole wig off and go, well, why are you wearing a wig? <laughs> yeah. Ha ha. <laughs> but the doctor says it doesn't matter what hair it is, eyebrows, nose hair. I mean, it's got to be a bit more suspicious if you go around pulling people's oh, nose hair, so. but yeah. whatever. <laughs> but they're saying whatever hair is on the face, that can tell you if they're parasites or not. In light of this, the room is asked to each pull out a hair to prove that they are human. Fair enough. Yeah. You never know. Someone could be infiltrating. Sinichi tells us in a voiceover that it's school is normal. It didn't take long for school to get back to how it was. Right. And he bumps into Murano. He questions about Yuko and apparently she's coming back that day. So she's had her time off and now she's coming back. Murano thanks Sinichi and asks about his abilities. So the fact he can jump and run so well. He puts it down to adrenaline, yeah. which, yeah. I mean, I don't know if adrenaline will make you survive jumping out of a two-story window, but... Yeah. But he was just like, it was just the rush of the moment and I just had to do it and it just somehow... But she was also like messed up. She's like, she'd probably believe anything at that point. Like, as long as I'm not dead, I'm good. They see two young girls meet and they each pull out a hair from their head. Sinichi tells us that though the public weren't told about the parasites, they have been told of how to do a new handshake, which yeah. is pulling out a hair from your head. And then credits. Yeah. And th this is the first one in a long time where it's ended actually okay. <laughs> like, yes. We, like, we know there's more to come, but it didn't end on, oh, bloodshed. Oh, no, someone's going to die. It's ended like, on, hey. It's like cliffhangers, happened. cliffhangers. Who's that? What's that? This one is like, ah. So the rumor mill has done its bit, and there, there's a new fad. And I'm like, that's a really clever little, like. And so yeah. now, so the cliffhangers now on the parasite side of like, what are they going to do to combat this new fad? And the fact that parasites are basically kind of becoming public knowledge but at least actually known by governments now lots still to talk about but i feel like i know it's not halfway but it feels like a halfway point yeah. of like right we've <sighs> we've got our storyline and you know it's people know about it so how are we going to deal with it yeah that's what it feels like so yeah it's it's, it's very traumatic <laughs> <laughs> it is it is quite traumatic and really it's like, traumatic oh, but it's like, and it's going to, yeah, oh, and some of the, like, violence to come, I keep going. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, again, it's like, what, what's episode 10? And we just had a class massacre. Like, yeah. you know, what's it going to be like in, closer to the end when things are, when oh. you know, heavy stuff's going to go down? It's just, oh. oh, when a certain character comes into it, you're going to be like, holy moly. Well, as we have been doing for the last few episode because i am overly traumatized by what we're seeing we now have tagira's happy moment with lizzie yep i'm here too so have you got anything nice to i binge watched that new netflix show cursed which yes it's not like the next brilliant best thing it's a little bit like it's a bit slow burn and it's a bit silly but it's a bit mindless fun but it does have a host of very attractive characters and like pretty much the entire internet because i went on and went asked is anybody else crushing on the weeping knight and then the whole of twitter <laughs> came out of the woodwork to go yes the weeping knight so that was quite a lovely moment of like going online last night and going in who else is crushing on the weeping knight and having 82 people retweet and reply going yes we all love the weeping knight and have a lovely conversation about why he's so hot and why he's the best character and i was like oh fandom i love it <laughs> well i've read an article in preparation for this in america there's a group of people who are called wine fairies so basically i know you're like wine fairies <laughs> best fairies <laughs> ever so basically it's a group of people who dress up like fairies and they go from house to house just leaving nice gifts on people's doorsteps to like cheer him up in the covid uh, lockdown and stuff and yeah it's it's anonymous and they just go around leave i mean that, like one of the baskets was shown it was like a glass and some wine and some chocolates and some little notes and things it's just like oh that's so sweet and it's become this huge thing like it, there's a facebook page for it and then it's like um they want to do the brotherhood of booze and beer you know to join it and then they want to do a non-alcoholic one for children and it's like this huge thing that's becoming um, like just uh, anonymous gift giving to make people smile. So that's what the well world done. needs right now. It well really done, wine does. fairies. Yeah. So that was my nice thing that I Aww. that made me smile this week. Social media. Woo, God, our episodes have been so dark. It's hard to think of things to come in on. 
Um, my social media is coming in on a flying bottle of paint thinner, and it's going to go whoosh, 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 <laughs> splat, and then my social media comes out. Mine is coming in on me proving that I'm not a parasite. Here's my hair. Whoop. There you go. Oh, what's what's under my hair? Oh, shouldn't be showing that. Put my hair back on. Joyous. <laughs> Say goodbye, Lizzie. So for now, this is a weeaboo saying journey. And this is a newbie saying, what's under your hair, Lizzie? Oh, dear. <laughs>